ridiculously badly made kettle. The f <laughs> Today we're going to be looking at Higgs and Ophysics, specifically the Chernobyl Accident Visualize with our lovely green barrels here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. The Chernobyl accident. The physics clearly explained the worst nuclear accident in history. But why did it happen? Today I'll show you. That's step footage by from step, the show. I'll explain the relevant nuclear physics. I'll implement that in code and make a basic model of the Chernobyl reactor. Oh, then okay. I'll use the model to explain and redo the same terrible decisions in the Chernobyl control room, and you'll be able to see how the reactor responds. And oh, this is cool looking. All right. Exactly what went wrong. A very simple reactor. But let's start with the basics. In any <laughs> nuclear reactor, you must bring the reactivity up to power and keep it balanced there. That's another definition of the... W so that right there is a way to define what critical really means. Just means steady state. Neutron population is the same. Otherwise known as hot steady normal, steaming and dreaming, easy money. Power from the nuclear reactor heats up water into steam, which then drives a turbine to generate power, which is done by fission. I do recommend watching my video about critical mass where simulate a nuclear reactor and also an atomic bomb while going into deeper details about fission, but don't- oh, so he's done a few nuclear things, that's cool. Worry. I'll assume you are lazy and quickly recap now. I'll also start I'll building up the model so we'll be able to simulate the Chernobyl reactor. The nuclear reactor uses uranium of the isotope 235. This element has the property of undergoing induced fission, which is when the element absorbs a neutron. The element will split, i.e. fission, into two new lighter daughter elements. And so when he says induced fission, he means that in contrast to spontaneous fission, Spontaneous fission is effectively another radioactive decay mode where you don't need a neutron to induce the fission. It's just an unstable isotope that sloughs off another nuclei that's something bigger than an alpha particle. And it generally occurs for super heavy elements. But it is actually possible in uranium-238. But to give a sense of scale, Uranium-238 undergoes alpha decay, a helium nucleus, on the order of billions of years. The half-life is 5 billion years for uranium-238. The half-life for spontaneous fission for uranium-238 is on the order of 10 to the 16th power years. So, you don't see that very often. Release three new neutrons. Now, these daughter elements are not important for the bigger picture, so not to confuse ourselves visually in the model. Instead of showing two daughter elements, I'll simply just show whether the element is uranium-235 or not. Blue for uranium-235. Unless it's something like xenon, but I'm sure he'll get to that later, where xenon gets in the way of causing more uranium-235 fissions. 235, gray if it isn't. We can stack many uranium-235 in a metal grid and fire a single neutron. We oh, just create a nuclear chain reaction. This is what we want in a nuclear reactor. Got Although counter, we want it a popcorn. bit more controlled and not this explosive. In the reactor, we will have different isotopes of uranium in the fuel, and only a few percentages is the fissile type, uranium-235. This is how the metal is extracted from the ground. Having highly enriched fuel in a reactor is not only extremely expensive, but also way too dangerous. You can see in this reaction with a lot less fissile material, in the type of reactor he's talking about, you can have reactors in nuclear submarines that have enrichment north of 90% and they're perfectly safe. But it depends on other design elements of the reactor. The reaction seems way more stable. The goal, of course, is to get the reactor up to some amount of reactions per second. And once you are there, you keep it stable by ensuring each loose neutron on average only hits a single uranium-235. Now, I want to add two more things to the model before continuing. These are just for helping my model and not really of any importance in actual reactors. Okay. The first thing I want to add is the ability to replace used up fuel. Since I only have around a thousand simulated uranium nuclei, okay. I need to be able to magically pop in new and rich uranium. The second thing I want- Sure, we can have it with a nice continuous refueling cycle, kind of like can-do reactors. Of course, those only use natural uranium anyway, but sure, we'll fuel this reactor rotisserie style. Why not? 
want to add in the model is the radioactive decay spontaneous neutron emission. This is when a radioactive element suddenly releases a neutron, a naturally occurring process. Let's give this property to all non-uranium nuclei, i.e. the gray circles. Building Interesting. I mean, that's you use things like that, such as californium-252 directly, but they're often mixtures such as radium and beryllium that just spit out neutrons. And yeah, you need sources, you need something to essentially start the reactor. They're basically the matches if this were a campfire. The simulation control rods. I want to simulate the same type of reactor used in the Chernobyl accident, the RBMK reactor, which apparently is not an abbreviation for a ridiculously badly made <laughs> kettle. <The f> <laughs> It's in Russian, but the translation is a high power channel type reactor. First thing I want to add is control rods. Control rods have the property to absorb neutrons. And just to state the obvious, you can cool down a reactor blue by inserting control rods and you can heat up a reactor red by removing the rods, allowing neutrons to flow freely. We don't For this simulation, I can see why you're going with that. You're going with those as your heat input because it's on and off and obviously causing more fission generates more heat. There's a little bit more going on, but we'll roll with that. Now, I wonder for these control rods if he's including the graphite tips so they actually increase your reaction speed when you fully insert them before they shut them down. Terrible design. It's the equivalent of when you slam on the brakes, you actually accelerate for a split second. I have everything yet to fully simulate the Arabian K reactor and its downfall, but for now, let's run what we have. Okay. It's a very basic nuclear reactor model. Normally, reactor reactivity is measured in megawatts, but I'll just count the number of neutrons. Not a unit I've ever used. So the unit I use is uh, PCM, which stands for percent milli rho. So the definition of reactivity is the departure from criticality. That is to say, when you're critical, steady state reactivity is zero. So positive reactivity, power is going up. Negative reactivity, power is going down. And percent milli rho is a ratio, dimensionless. Abbreviated PCM. 1 PCM is 1 100,000th of the way from subcritical to critical. So it's a small unit. And you use really small units because reactor operators control reactivity quite precisely. So 100 PCM means you're 0.1% above what is required for criticality. That means reactor power is going up a little bit. And it's often used in the context of how much a form of reactivity is being added so an individual control rod could be worth minus 500 pcm for instance when it's fully inserted and this sort of stuff can get fairly complicated and every core is unique to its design so there's a nuclear design report that comes out after each reactor is refueled that tells you how much each control rod is worth and it's a team effort between both the reactor operators and the reactor engineers, essentially when you're changing power level to go over how much each control rod is worth. Now control rods aren't the only thing that affect reactivity, but the point is it essentially measures how fast the reactor is, is accelerating or decelerating. But I'll just count the number of neutrons present in the reactor. You can see that number on top here. Okay. I've coded some very basic automatic control of the control rods. Every second rod will go up if there is under 40 neutrons inside the reactor. If there is above 40, the control rods will be inserted instead, as you can see. By slowly pulling out control rods, I'm able to increase reactivity safely, whereas reinserting the control rods decreases the reactivity. Building. This is not a bad way to explain it. I mean, this would be useful in a lot of initial reactor operations classes that are training reactor operators. Because interestingly enough, you don't have to be a nuclear engineer to be a reactor operator or vice versa. I was already um, before going to operations class, but this will help people who are more visually inclined. Because I remember trying to explain reactivity can be a little challenging. The simulation water. All right, let's keep adding real physics concepts to the model. As I briefly mentioned, the reaction is surrounded by water, which heats up and drives mm -hmm. a turbine. I'll depict water as a small box. The water has a low chance of absorbing a neutron. Whenever a neutron scatter with water, 
it will transmit kinetic energy heating up the water. In the model, let's add whenever a neutron is inside the water, it will heat it up. When water is cold, I'm coloring it blue and then fading it into red as it gets hotter. But the key thing about water though is it actually slows down neutrons, it moderates them, so their likelihood of causing fission increases. Now in this RBMK reactor though, it wasn't the main moderator. The main moderator is graphite. But, but water is often the moderator in a lot of other nuclear reactor designs, including the plant that I worked at. But I also want to add when the water gets too hot, it evaporates. When this happens, the water is gone and can no longer absorb neutrons. In An RBMK is a type of boiling water reactor. So yes, this does indeed happen in this reactor design. But in a pressurized water reactor, this sort of thing would not happen. The only kind of boiling in a pressurized water reactor is little localized bubbles that actually help with heat transfer. If water is boiling in a pressurized water reactor like this, that's a bad day. My model, this is going from red to completely gone. When water cools off, it condensates and reappears. Let's try it again and fire even more neutrons than last time. The front this of the so burst is mostly absorbed while heating up the water. This means the backside can easily propagate without being absorbed. In reality, of course, yeah, there will be back. some temperature exchange between each water block. But let's just ignore that fact. You can also see the water reappears. So for our reactor, that means... Because it's still a continuous uh, recirculation loop, just like any other system where you boil in the main pressure vessel. Presence of a lot of water will keep the reactivity down, whereas heating up the water will lead to holes or voids, and the reactivity will go up even further. Reactors with this property are said to have a positive void coefficient. Let's see that in action from the... Ex positive void coefficient. Not completely unique to RBMKs, there's a few other designs out there, but you don't really see that much anymore in what's currently being operated. So this is a type of reactivity coefficient. And a coefficient is just a property that affects how much the reactor's power level changes. So reactivity coefficient is just a property that affects how fast the reactor accelerates or decelerates. One example is temperature of the fuel, and that's always a negative coefficient. That is to say, the uranium fuel pellets heat up. The more it heats up, the more the reaction wants to set to shut itself down. And that's due to the Doppler effect, the very same effect when you hear an ambulance drive past you, that change in pitch. Basically what happens is the uranium 238, we're still mostly 238 at this point because enrichment is on the order of three to 5% for most reactors, even lower for an RBMK. And uranium 238, the probability of it absorbing a neutron goes up so you have less neutrons available for fission. Which is a nice feature because as the reactor heats up, it wants to shut itself down. So it's a natural feedback mechanism for you, which actually makes reactors easier to control. Now this positive void coefficient, on the other hand, that's what you don't want. Because that means as the amount of voids increase, the reactor's power level goes up. Especially dangerous because excess steam is produced in the event of an accident. You often get excess steam in the event of an accident, so that make, that's gonna in, that's gonna make the reactor's power go up in the event of an accident, which is the opposite of what you want. You want to emergency shut down the reactor. Same before with the control rods. Notice that we now have to lift the control rods even up further because the water is helping to absorb the neutrons. But because the control rods keep the reactivity down to 40 neutrons inside, you won't see enough neutrons to evaporate the water for now. You'll have to wait a bit to see the positive void coefficient in action. Yes. One thing that this, that this thing visualizes is there's an important parameter known as axial flux that shows up, and that basically means how high up a lot of the reactions are occurring. So, as you can see, there's not much fission going on at the top of the core, and that's because those control rods are still partially inserted. So it's going to basically prevent any fission from happening up there. Which is one of the reasons why you don't just use control rods by itself, because ideally you want a nice, uniform power distribution. There's other ways to do that, such as varying your enrichment, varying how much uranium-235 you put in each location because ideally you want a fairly optimized distribution. And really what it comes down to is reactor engineers want to design a Scrabble board with the optimal positioning of your double word and triple word scores. 
building the simulation xenon for this chapter i'll keep Here it short it and concise and don't explain that much after absorbing a neutron at a later time the nuclei will have a chance to decay into the isotope xenon 135 i'll denote xenon with the same dark gray color as the control rods xenon has the property to strongly absorb neutrons it's actually even stronger than control rods but it's isolated rather than a control rod being a long rod that go as much of the length of the core. Once it's a xenon element, the only way to undo that is for the element to absorb a neutron. This is what is referred to as burning away yep. xenon. Now let's run the model again with the xenon property. You'll see once again, it's now hard of the reactor and we must raise the control rods even further to get the same reactivity level around 40 neutrons. This comes up whenever you're changing the reactor's power level. You have xenon peaks, where xenon slows down your reaction and xenon valleys when you do a down power and a raise power. And there's a couple of metrics. One is it can absorb a neutron, but the other thing is it can decay away. It has a half-life of about nine hours. So its radioactive decay is enough that if you were to operate this thing on a load-follow basis, you're going to notice this in between shifts. And it's important to include this in your reactivity briefing between when the next crew comes in. There's another reactor poison. Yeah, yes, reactor operators call this poison. That shows up. It's called samarium. But its half-life is on the order of days. And its tendency to absorb neutrons and stops fissions is much less. So it doesn't really come up as often. So it doesn't really affect reactivity control as much, but it does come up from time to time. This would be a really fun screensaver. You can see how it's affecting it more. Building the simulation, moderation. Last thing to add. The when graphite. neutrons are released from the nuclei, they fly out with around 5% the speed of light. Let's add the property to the model. Now neutrons sent out from nuclei are fast. I will denote that with a white dot in the neutron. <laughs> <laughs> this speed is way too fast for fission absorption. It turns out the chance of interaction is incredibly low then. This is called the nuclear cross-section. It can be thought of as the probability of a reaction. When they are going fast, I'll set the interaction chance to 0%. For fission, you must first use the so-called moderator. Something for the... Interesting is, at fast speed, it actually has a greater chance of it fissioning uranium-238. Still pretty low. And there are certain fuel types that designed to operate mostly in a fast neutron spectrum. RBMK is not one of them. Neutron to scatter on and absorb some kinetic energy. In the RBMK reactor, all fuel rods were surrounded by graphite for moderation. In the model, I'll depict a moderator as a white rod with a gray border. After collision with the moderator, the neutrons are no longer too fast and so he's actually shown a couple of different concepts here, both moderation and reflection. Reflection is exactly what it sounds like. You want to keep the neutrons inside the reactor to avoid it escaping. Water has both of those properties as well. But for an RBMK reactor, the majority of this phenomenon is going to be caused by the graphite are instead called thermal neutrons, which basically just means slow neutrons. Let's have these thermal neutrons behave just as before with an... One other way of visualizing this the difference between fast and thermal is fast are on the order of millions of electron volts and thermal is less than one electron volt. So they're just way less energetic, the thermal neutrons. But they're at a magic speed that has them cause thermal fissions in something like uranium-235. The action chance of 100% when the neutrons and nuclei touch. When thermal neutrons collide with the moderator, we will just set them to fly right through. To make sure we're on the same page, I'll run the model without control rods, water or the xenon property only with the fission fuel and moderators slowly being inserted. Hopefully this depicts the influence of moderation and the nuclear so, you're, so this is a little different, but it's kind of, it's a funny idea. You're inserting backwards control rods is what you're doing. Section. Accelerator this is rods. another control of reactivity. Removing moderation oh, yeah. means neutrons will have a much lower chance of undergoing fission, while more moderation means more neutrons will have a high probability of fission. Finally, let's see everything together. A lot is going on, so for this model I added a legend of all the different objects below. 
Okay, good. He's putting it in there that the moderators don't move, that they're not supposed to. Now we have everything we need to recreate the Chernobyl accident. I'll recreate the same events. Under control, now let's break it. I love it. It's in the control room. Here's the first event. Day of the accident, event 1, reactor normal. The simulation I'm showing right now is showing how the reactor was running stable just before the accident. It was running at around 50% power to meet power demands for the grid line. The xenon was being burned off. That's a red flag right there. I talk about this a lot more in my review of the Chernobyl series, but RBMKs are not the most stable at low power. Just as quickly as it was being made, reactor is stable. We can pretend the 50% power... It is stable. Let me rephrase that. When you're at low power, a small reactivity change causes a larger effect. That's what I mean about it being more challenging to maintain stability. Response to 40 active neutrons, which is what the control rods here are trying to stay stable at. To illustrate the states we just saw, here I'm plotting the reactivity of the reactor and according to the events, event 1, reactor normal. For this event, the reactor was running at 50%. On this plot here, I'll show how many of the control rods was present, how much water was in the reactor. The water was stable, cooling the reactor down, some voids here and there. I'll also plot how much xenon was present, not much. Day of the accident, event 2, power reduction. Let's continue the simulation from where we stopped last time. We'll do that from now on. Well, what happened then? A safety test was scheduled later this night. This test required the power to be reduced to around 30% power. Mm -hmm. We can pretend 30% power corresponds to 20 active neutrons and set the automatic control rods to try and hit this number. What we can that technically is, for a simplistic sim simulation like this, that is a way of measuring power, because you can measure power in terms of how many neutron counts. When you're at extremely low power, that's actually how you do it. It's what's known as source range nuclear instruments that express it as counts per second. That's your unit of reactor power when you're essentially shut down. The thing is, when you're operating on the, on, on the megawatt scale, you're not counting the neutrons because the amount of power you're producing is creating conditions that are way too hot. I mean, technically on extended range nuclear instruments, a number is shown, but it doesn't mean anything. What matters is megawatts. See here is the xenon is still being generated from a delayed reaction when the reaction ran at 50% power. But only now 30% power burns the xenon away. Mm -hmm. Let's see the state of the simulation we just saw. The reactivity? Well, around 30%. Control rods were inserted in order to try and reach this reduced power level. For some reason they also increased the water flow cooling, meaning control rods has to be raised even further up. However, the they had issues with pumps, both in the primary and the secondary system. Lower power means not as many neutrons are present to burn the xenon away. That and they were running weird, and that and they were doing a weird special test that involved procedure deviation. Day of the accident, event three, power drop. After that, the power unexpectedly dropped to one percent. Because of the high xenon buildup, we are reaching very low levels. I set the control rods to try and reach twenty active neutrons. So the way xenon works. There's actually a good rule of thumb that shows up, and the xenon peak occurs basically the square root of how much you drop the reactor by percent wise. So if you cut reactor power by 50%, for example, um, the xenon peak is going to show up in square root of 50 hours, or about 7 hours. So that's a good thing to plan for when you're doing shift turnover and briefing the other reactor operators. But in my simulation we are reaching lower values because of the high xenon buildup. Mm -hmm. This is me trying to show you a reactor stalling and stuck in the xenon pit. This is the 1% unexpected power drop I'm trying to show that happened the day of the accident. Yeah, it's stalling out, yeah. <laughs> so the power level is plummeted to 1%. They didn't change anything to the control rods, of course. The reactor was simply stalling because of the extra high water flow with no voids and the external poison continually building up from the simulation. reactor running at 50% oh, yeah. power. Day of the accident, event 4. Power up attempted. Now many safety systems were turned off. Safety protocols. And the thing is, Xenon's gonna burn out soon, but they didn't account for that. 
ignored automatic control of the control rods was turned off in an attempt to power up the reactor. They were only able to get the reactor up running at 7% power by pretty much removing all control rods. Notice the control Something you'd never do now. There's an international rule at this point. Don't pull rods when you're in a transient or to maintain reactor temperature or anything like that. Once they lost control of their reactor, they should have emergency shutdown or reactor trip or reactor scram. That's all that, all that means the same thing at that point. If they would have shut down the reactor rather than pulling out all control rods like this, right when they hit the 1% and lost control, they would have been fine. Rods are raised, but the water and xenon keeps the reaction in check. Never be all rods out. There's, there's hard safety limits in there now. Um, there were even safety limits back then, but they defeated their safety systems. Again, something that's impossible now that you, you can't even get. That, but I mean, here, they're in the given it all she's got phase and it's still not quite enough. Yeah, here's your son, you lost control of your reactor. Yeah, just to try to maintain that. So, the that. state is 7% power, all control rods raised, water level is still cooling the core, and Xenon keeps building up from the delayed reaction. Day of the accident, event 5. Test starts. The reactor was still stuck at 7% power. The computer warns them to shut down immediately, so they turn off the computer instead. They could not get... The <laughs> and keep in mind, the computer back then lagged, so... They're, they're ahead of what the computer thinks the reactor parameters are at. So basically, if back then, if the computer tells you to turn off your reactor, you should have turned off your reactor 10, 20 minutes ago. Power higher than 7%, and yet they started the test. Pretty much all control rods are still raised. The test included switching off half the recirculation pumps temporarily. To reflect this change in the water pumps, I'll simply allow the water to cool off much slower. The effect is, of course, more water boils away, causing more xenon to burn off, and this is a positive feedback loop. Yep. Positive feedback loop is scary words to hear in the world of nuclear reactor operation. You don't want positive feedback. Maybe that's why people hardly ever give you a compliment there. Causing ever more water to evaporate, causing ever more xenon to burn away. Right, so the reactor is stuck in 7% power. Pretty much all control rods are still raised, water is boiling away, quickly forming voids, causing more xenon to burn. So right now, according to just this model, he's showing three different ways of adding positive reactivity. There's actually a bit more stuff going on, because for, for instance, water, water boiling away is actually going to lower temperature of your cool, is going to lower temperature of the liquid portion of your coolant, which is further going to add increases in reactivity. And these are not small increases in reactivity. These are, well, you're going to see. The day of the accident, event 6, scram. Now here's something I hadn't added to the simulation. The control rods actually had graphite displaces yep. hanging below, looking something like this. Commonly said, graphite tips. So actually, this whole time, the scenario should have looked like this instead. Now I'll add that to the simulation. Let's continue. Those are some big tips, but I can understand for the purpose of this simulation. Continue the simulation with these added changes. Let's pause the simulation. Suddenly. With the water and the xenon disappearing, the reactor increases unexpectedly fast in the reactor and the operators... You're adding four different methods of reactivity all at once, and, and then you're gonna hit the brakes, which temporarily hits the accelerator. Notice this and presses the scram button, aka AZ5, a safety switch. The scram button's job is to put in all of the control rods as absolutely fast as possible. It was a... Which for Chernobyl sucked because it was on the order of... A minute when now it's a couple of seconds in current reactor designs. Lifeline, the operators always thought they had in case something went wrong in the test. Anyway, pressing this scram button, it will take some time to deploy the control rods. They are slow. The operator didn't know what they just had done. Another terrible design of the Chernobyl reactor. They're not supposed to move slow. Now they fall in as fast as gravity will take them. Because normally the top had a lot more stopping power than the accelerating bottom graphite. But the reactor was in such an unstable state that the bottom had much, much stronger accelerating power than the top had a stopping power. And 
One other thing that's not shown in the simulation is there was damage that already occurred to the reactor. So there were, in, there were moments when this happened that essentially just the tip went in because the rest of the control rod couldn't fit because the geometry of the core was so deformed because of what they did to their reactor. As a result, the scram actually increased the reaction rate after I littered the control rods and the graphite displacers were stuck. Control rods didn't get far enough in the reactor to do any difference. Let's just quickly see the states here in the pause of the simulation. The power had unexpectedly raised a lot. Control rods were set in by the scram, but it was stuck. And all of a sudden, all the water flash balls away and all of the free neutrons burn away all of the xenon. Now there's nothing to stop the reactor. The reactor yeah. is just set in such a crazy state. I actually like that the words for all the positive reactivity stacked on top of each other. So. Back to my break analogy again. So the break analogy is how this reactor design usually works when you, it hits the accelerator before the break. This is showing that on a regular car, effectively, since you got so much wind up, the brake isn't hitting the accelerator. The brake is activating booster rockets to your car before it applies the brakes. It's just all gas and no brakes. Let's see that. Here you see the control rods with the graphite displacers got stuck. Wow. Oh my ears. Extreme and there is the your heavy accident. metal rods, fuel rods and the graphite and the control rods are jumping up and down in the circuits due to the extreme pressure. It has been estimated the power was over 100,000% its design capacity. And of course, the core could not hold that together. Ex yeah, and the main way to estimate that is by uh, calculating how much energy was released and where all the bits and pieces of reactor went. Explosion occurred. So hopefully now you have an intuition analysis. on what went wrong and also learned a little nuclear physics. I basically only cover the physics and the incredibly dangerous design of the RBNK reactor, but there are tons of other factors that also played a role which we didn't cover, okay. such as human errors and unexperienced team, the lack of any safety culture, the ability to turn off safety system, cheap reactors over safety, the Soviet Union and the corrupt system, and more. And if you want to hear more about that, please check out my reaction to the Chernobyl series. Now, I don't want you to walk away with the feeling that nuclear reactors are unsafe. This is just Thank one you. reactor design and many more I appreciate safe that. reactor design exists. For example, ones with the negative void coefficient. They are impossible to blow up. I could simulate that for you one day. And last even including all of the death of this horrible accident, nuclear reactors are still much, much more safe. Thank you for putting that. That's actually the same reference I often use when comparing nuclear power generation to other energy sources. That was a very satisfying to watch simulation and he did a really, really good job. Thanks so much for the recommendation and thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.